Hello and welcome back to GG Reviews. I am GG and today we are going to be reviewing the classic Black Library novel Storm of Iron by Graham McNeil. I don't have the book in front of me today unfortunately um, because I spilled coffee on it before we got started but I'm going to put an image of the two covers, the original and the re-issue uh, of it that came a few years later and rather than painting any of the characters from the novel because they don't have any models we're going to be reviewing this uh, lovely obliterator from the new Storm of, uh, not Storm of Iron, the Shadow Spear set from 2019. That's very Iron warriors because they feature in the novel. So, without further ado, on with the review. Storm of Iron was published back in 2002, which is a long time ago now, and has since become an absolute classic in the Black Library. It's a good book to introduce new readers to the universe, some of the key factions and what the rules of the universe are. The cover description puts it pretty well. On the nightmare battlefields of the Warhammer 40,000 universe, few foes spark more fear and dread than the Chaos Space Marines. Nurturing a hatred that is millennia old, they attack without mercy, spreading terror and destruction in their wake. Now hell has come to Hydra Cordatus for a massive force of terrifying iron warriors, brutal assault troops of Chaos, have invaded the planet and lain siege to its mighty Imperial Citadel. But what prize could be worth so much savage bloodshed and destruction? And how can the defenders possibly hold out? The book starts off at the opening of the siege and pitches the Iron Warriors against the forces of the Imperium. Now, as you can probably figure out from that, the Iron Warriors are one of the Chaos Space Marine Legions who we've covered on a previous review, which was the Primogenitor Reviews. And the Iron Warriors are the fourth legion, the Empress Children were the third, one of the traitor legions who now haunt the galaxy as spectral terrors, as said dead in there. And in this novel, we see them fighting the forces of the Imperium. So it's a straightforward setup as to who's fighting who, Imperial versus Chaos. Now, one of the other things to say about this before we dive too far into it is that this was a very early novel. So a lot of the specificity which comes in things like the Horus Heresy, the Siege of Terror, and subsequent books that centre on, you know, the Imperium and the Chaos Space Marines as a whole isn't there, but this is one of those books which very much laid the foundations for that sort of specificity. So we will, as we go, we will start to see that more and more. The book characterises the two sides very well. The defending Imperials have a more diverse force, ranging from the Astro Militarum, people just like you and me, the cyborgs of the Adeptus Mechanicus, the giant war machines of the Titan Legions, and the super soldiers of the Space Marines, the, the good Space Marines, not the evil ones, although we've talked about them quite a lot recently. Um, however, they are less unified overall, other in their mission to defend the fortress, and each one has their own agenda throughout the book. Whereas the forces of Chaos are more unified under the iron control of their commander, the Warsmith. Great name. Um, again, short name at least, to be fair. Whilst his subordinates are happy to bicker and insult each other, they know whose authority they ultimately answer to. For me, the pacing of this book is excellent, and it keeps you turning every page. Every engagement has consequences. Every loss on both sides is keenly felt, whether it's a few isolated soldiers or an entire battalion gets wiped out. You get a clear sense that this conflict is costing both sides heavily, and time is a constant factor for each side. One of the most interesting things about this story for me was I didn't want one side or the other to succeed as I was reading, but I wanted to know who would win. And this was quite nice as a way to break down the straightforward Imperial's good, chaos, bad archetype the sort of book would otherwise have to deal with. This also has the added advantage of allowing us to get invested in both sides, seeing how the internal politics of each faction threatens the integrity of both sides. You see this quite a lot in other books as well, and also in reality, to be fair to us, so it's nice to see it again here. But what makes it stand out here is that it gives us a chance to actually get to know the characters involved on both sides. Unlike some other books which focus heavily on one side or the other, such as the Fabius Bar books in the early series, it lets us focus on one side or the other. And by doing that, we get a real sense of a very rich world and a very rich and very interesting conflict that's taking place. Luckily for us as readers, we don't necessarily have to think about focusing too much on one side, and everyone who reads this book will find characters on either side who they identify with more. And especially for myself, I very much found myself finding characters on both sides that I liked and characters that I didn't like necessarily. The good thing about this particular way of characterising everyone is that you get a really rich world and a far more interesting conflict because you see the faces of both sides 
and how that conflict affects both sides in a far more visceral way. You feel the losses of both sides, like I said earlier, but it also means that you get to know what those losses mean to the individuals in it and who within those factions is losing more and those who are standing higher in the esteem of their comrades, as it were. The story has a fair amount of suspense in it as well, as both sides also must use cunning and ingenuity, as well as pursuing martial strength to overcome their opponents. Graham McNeil does a good job setting up and paying off all the weaknesses or secret weapons the two sides exploit throughout the book. However, each time you think one side has the upper hand, the other is able to find something to level the playing field. Now, as far as battle novels go, this is a really nice thing as well. It stops it simply being about who has the biggest army or the most powerful guns or the sharpest knives or the most explodey bombs, I suppose. And it's also about the wit, the cunning, the intelligence how arrogance can sometimes let one side down, or a simple soldier can turn the tide of an entire battle without having to do much work whatsoever, or a well-placed explosion suddenly changes everything. And that's what also gives this book a real edge to it, and it makes it more interesting to see not just who the sides are, but what they're using and how they're thinking. That's quite fun as well to see throughout the course of this novel. And as a result, when the end of the book comes, it feels natural as well as well-earned. The final chapters pay off the work that the characters have put into their mission, and even if you do find yourself more aligned with one side or the other, you will leave with respect for both sides quite equally, knowing that this was a conflict which cost them both, and they both had to work hard to get any sort of victory. And one of the good things about Storm of Iron is that whilst it does have its band of brothers-ish moments, it doesn't hold on to that idea of here are noble bands of warriors who are all honourable and sticking together. They squabble, they fight... They don't get along, apart from out of the convenience of their mission. And because this is reflected on both sides, it says quite a lot about the state of both factions in a macrocosm. But here in this microcosm, albeit a very big, exploding microcosm, we get to see how that pays off in a really tangible way. Now, I've been very complimentary so far, and there is very little in the grand scheme of things about Storm of Iron that is lacking. However, there are a few small things I do want to mention. As good as the book is at building and paying off its suspense, it lets itself down a little bit in some of the characters. Whilst there is a broad ensemble across the two sides, most of them show little personality in their downtime. This could be forgiven, as the stakes are high for both sides, but because there is very little character development, with maybe a handful of exceptions, the book ends with us knowing about the same amount about our characters as when we started. Now, like I said... They are very much pencils down, we have a mission, and I like that aspect about it, like I said. However, when we do have time to get to know our characters, occasionally we don't necessarily get to know them as people. We're still very much going, I am doing this, and that's all we get to know. So some of the um, payoffs do lose a little bit of weight when we start to see characters doing things or paying off things, which we otherwise would have had a little bit more insight, would have made them a bit stronger. But as a result, we don't get that insight, so we only feel the same way about them as we did at the beginning. Also, this is a nitpick, and as I said at the beginning of this review, the only thing this book lacks is the specificity that has come from later novels. So as much as I do find this novel is a good story, and it's good at what it does, when we think about we've had 18 years' worth of new books coming out exploring characters like Abaddon the Despoiler and Fabius Bile, we've had the Beast Arising series... We've had um, the Horace Heresy series and the Siege of Terror series, and we've had novels based on characters like Eisenhorn, Ibram Gorn. If these mean nothing to you, they mean nothing to you. But these are all really good milestone series and novels in their own right, and have contributed a lot to Black Library. As such, going back to read Storm of Iron, whilst it is still a good book, it does lack some of the personality some of the later books have, which I think almost shows us how far we moved on, but luckily it doesn't age the book that well. Also, as much as this is a nitpick, I do feel that some of the engagements themselves um, go on for a little bit too long. Yes, I know, this is a battle novel, and I like the battling. However, occasionally we find ourselves the battles that take a little bit too long, and the results of the payoffs that we get earlier, or seeing the clever tactics, have long since passed, but for some reason we're still in the trenches, we're still watching the fighting, when the action itself could have moved on by now. Still, 
all things I've mentioned before make up for the shortcomings. The pulse-pounding action that has consequences to both sides is what brings this book to life. Battles are satisfying in their execution, mostly, and all of them tie into the story. Whether it's a minor skirmish or a pitched battle, they all feel like vital steps in the story, and thankfully, none of them feel like they are there to pad up the length of the book. You feel the pressure both sides are under, and the sense that they are running out of time and resources adds weight to the conflict. The myriad of different tactics and strategies the two sides use keeps up the pace of the book and stops the action from becoming monotonous or repetitive. This book is also excellent at delving into the history of the Iron Warriors. It does this without it turning into an exposition dump, and as it often ties directly into what is happening in the moment, so it's always relevant to the situation. It is a book that lives up to the phrase, show, don't tell. All these are strengths that make the book stand out, but its execution gives it its biggest strength, the accessibility as a novel. Storm of Iron is probably one of the most influential Warhammer novels out there. It ties directly into Grant McNeil's other Warhammer books that came later and has been a source of inspiration for the books of the Horus Heresy. So I'd say it's, its strongest point is that you can pick up this book and read it with almost no knowledge of the Warhammer 40,000 universe. You'll experience a really good story with a lot of twists and turns, and a few interesting characters that will make you want to learn more about the universe. I think it's a foregone conclusion at this point that I do recommend this novel. I recommend it quite strongly, in fact. Given how well presented it is, there is definitely something for everyone in it, whether you're new to the universe or you're familiar with, uh, with the Warhammer 40,000 lore. Storm of Iron really is an essential read uh, that will honestly leave you wanting to know more. And it's one of the earliest books I ever read, so I can definitely tell, tell you it kept me reading for sure. So, there we have it. One finished Chaos Obliterator of the Iron Warriors Legion. Turned out pretty well, I think. Well, thank you very much for watching. Uh, please do like and subscribe and tune in again for more videos. I'm going to try and get them out a bit more frequently in the future. So, thank you very much for watching. Goodbye, friends, and have a lovely day.